is about the um, testing for COVID-19 or testing for SARS-CoV-2, identifying the SARS-CoV-2. So for that process, I am going to, uh, I have, this time I have already created a bunch of diagrams to go through. So let us start looking at those diagrams. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, let, let me just give you before sharing. The testing is done in two primary ways. One is to detect the antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 virus in the serum of the patient. And there are, uh, I think that in some countries there are even tests now. Hello, Harry. There are tests now that you can just like, you know, blood sugar test, you can just pinch, uh, put a pinch of blood on it and it gives you the antibody uh, percentage or quantity, possible quantity. So it has lines on it. Good evening, everyone. So that is an interesting test. We sh all should have it. Uh, but the serum antibody detection, that means when the virus is present in us, we make immune response to it. We make antibodies against its S proteins. And then those antibodies stay in our body for a long time. And these can be detected in our blood. So that is one type of test. The other type of tests that are very common <clears throat> are the tests that are done with the PCR kits. These are called the RT-PCR, and we'll talk about those today. The PCR kits, kits what they do is that there is a nasal swab. So imagine if this was a, a thing to take the swabs. So there is a nasal swab that is taken. That swab is sent to the lab, and the virus present in the nose, and the virus biggest quantity in the upper respiratory tract is present in the nose. So that virus genome or the RNA of the virus is then um, detected or identified through the PCR mechanism and that test would then come back positive or negative. So they're, they're, these are the basic two mechanisms. I'm going to go into the detail of both the mechanisms. The PCR test, <clears throat> there are no approved FDA PCR test kits, however, FDA has approved on emergency basis as uh, without the rigorous FDA testing process or evaluation process, they have given go ahead to a number of test case uh, kits to be used. So we'll look at those lists as well. Hey guys, how are you? <clears throat> so thank you very much for joining. Uh, thank you all. Let's start with this. So today what we will be doing is We'll do two kind of tests understanding. One is the PCR and the second one is ELISA. ELISA is for detecting antibodies in the serum and PCR is to detect the virus genome in the, in the upper respiratory tract. So let's start, ready? Welcome from Egypt to the point. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm gonna share my screen and we'll start. So look, I have today what I did was I have already um, drawn a bit of the thing so that we can easily do it. First, I'm going to show you the FDR. So if you look at this, what laboratories and manufacturers are offering tests for COVID-19. So FDR has a list of various organizations, various companies that are making the tests, as you can see them here, FDR has allowed them on an emergency basis to start using their test kits. So this list here and this list here is for those. So uh, I, I keep saying FDR, this is the, um, the fruit and uh, FDA. So here I have taken one of the cases. I've taken one of the companies and their test kit, and we are going to talk about that. This test kit is, if you see here, the name RRT-PCR kit. So reverse transcriptase real-time PCR test. So that is a name, reverse. So this R in the beginning. So RRT is reverse, transcript reverse transcriptase. PCR kit. So let's look at how these things work. I was having trouble saying it. Okay, so look, what we do is for the reverse transcriptase PCR test, we take the virus. So remember that the virus itself 
is coronavirus, if I make it over here, we know that coronavirus has an envelope. And then in the envelope, there are proteins, which are called S proteins, correct? And then we have, then we have E proteins, E proteins that are called envelope, envelope proteins. And then, of course, we know that the RNA of the virus is wrapped into a capsid protein or nucleocapsid protein or N protein, N protein. So what we detect through the what we detect through this uh, uh, testing is we detect N proteins and E proteins. These are the two proteins that they detect for. Or they detect the genes on the RNA. So if this is the RNA, this RNA, this red one, there are genes in this RNA that make these proteins. So they detect the genes for N and, and E. In addition to that, they also detect the gene for one more thing that is called open frame open frame reading B1 and open frame reading B2 genes. These are genes as well. So regardless of the name, the point is that there are genes on the RNA of the virus. There are genes against the RNA of the virus in the RNA of the virus. For example, there is E gene, there is N gene, and then ORFB2 gene. These three genes are detected to make sure to identify if the virus is there. So good. So the basic concept that you have to keep in mind is that we are going to take the RNA of the virus from our, so we're going to take the virus from the nasal swabs. Then we are going to put the virus in the, in a machine which will take the RNA of the virus and try to tell us if these three genes are present. And how do we know that if these genes are present, how do we know the structure of the genes? China had very early on in the infection, they had published the whole genome of the COVID-19. So we know the gene structure of the COVID-19. So hopefully, uh, thank you very much, Farooq Saab. Thank you. So hopefully, this is clear that in the first case, we are going to detect the genome. So how are we going to do that? If I come back here, look, first we'll take a nasal swab. So let's say this is a nasal swab. We take a nasal swab. We take that. Um, swab and we would send this to the lab. So this goes to lab. So what happens is in the lab, they are going to do the reverse transcriptase PCR test, and then they'll send you the results. This can actually be done normally in, within three, four hours, but labs are so busy at this time that sometimes at least in the US, the test results are arriving in three days or a week. But the machine that does it can do it within three, four hours. So now let's look at how this test works. So we are going to talk about the reverse transcriptase real-time PCR test. So that is a polymerase chain reaction. So this is done by using a machine. This machine is called thermocycler. What is the machine's benefit? Why is it called thermocycler? It is a machine in which when they put the tubes in this area, in this uh, plate, and they close this lid on it, then what happens is this machine can change the temperature as needed. This is why it is called thermocycler. It is a temperature cycling machine. <laughs> Ray, Ray is, you are you are looking for... Glimmer, huh? 
I hope he's not here or she's not here, whoever that person was. Very good. Very good. Congratulations, Sadi Khan. Okay. So back to the machine. So we have a thermocycler machine. What happens is in this machine, there are these tubes that are placed in this plate. Normally, there are about 96 of these tubes that can be put together. So this machine can work on 96 patients' data at one time. And within three to four hours, it can actually produce a result. So you can say that it can test 96 people within three to four hours. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. <laughs> All right. Uh, I do not know what is this written here uh, by Anil, but thank you very much. I hope this is something good. Uh, continuing back to this. So the machine is a thermocycler machine. This machine, what you do is you take the RNA of the patient's swab. So this is the virus. You take a primer. So what happens is that whenever enzymes work on DNA or RNA, whenever we want to make copies of them, we always need a starting point, which is called a primer. A primer is a starting point, And we artificially provide that primer so that enzymes can start working from there onwards. So is that clear? We take a piece of RNA, we attach a primer to it. The primer, you can say, is like a starter. So we tell the system to start from here. We tell the enzymes to start from here. So the enzymes would then connect with this primer and then they will manufacture the copies of the RNA. The basic point is we're going to take a few RNA pieces and then make billions of pieces from them and trillions of pieces from them. So when we make a large quantity of RNA, then we can detect it with assurance that it is present or not. So we take one copy. So basically, we are making photocopies of the RNA. That is a process. So let's see how that is done. So you take the RNA, you take the primer, you take the enzyme called reverse transcriptase. This is the enzyme that is going to take RNA and it is going to convert that RNA into a DNA. So that is the reverse trans transcriptase. Then we have a DNA polymerase. Polymerase name means something that forms. It is a manufacturing unit. So it is a DNA polymerase. That means it makes DNAs. So it makes copies of DNAs. And then there are some other reagents. So what is in this tube? In this tube is the RNA primer, the enzymes needed to make the copies, and then other uh, buffer agents. So now what we do is imagine that this is COVID-19. This is the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. I shouldn't say COVID-19. Let's say this is SARS-CoV-2 virus RNA. We take that virus RNA. The RNA has a structure usually that there is a starting point, which is always AUG. And there is a poly A tail, or this is always the ending. This is normally RNAs always have always have the start and end. Some RNAs do not. So I shouldn't say always. OK, back here, we have the virus RNA. Then what we do is we put the first enzyme to attach the primer to this RNA. And what happens is we create, see this enzyme, reverse transcriptase, this guy here. We put this enzyme on the primer and it would then continue going and make a copy of this RNA. So here, the virus has made a strand of DNA from the RNA. This strand is called complement DNA because it is a complement of the RNA. Good. So what we have done so far is nothing. The, the thing to note is this. This machine works with DNA. This machine works with DNA. And the virus has an RNA. So we are trying to make a DNA from an RNA. So how did we do that? We took the virus RNA. 
we put some enzymes in there, we created a primer, then we put the reverse transcriptase enzyme that created a DNA complement. Once we have the DNA complement available, which is this guy, then we have the polymerase enzyme that would work to create a complete DNA. Good. So this is the simplest process. You take the RNA, right? So you take the RNA, then what do you do? Who would tell me? You take the RNA from the virus, you attach a primer to it, then you put a, an enzyme that is going to make a complementary DNA strand from that RNA, a copy of that in the DNA uh, nucleotides, then we'll make a DNA. So now we have converted the virus RNA to DNA. Why did we do that? Because our machine works with DNAs. So we are going to do the DNA. Back here, let's continue. Let's see what happens next. Now that we have a DNA strand, what we do is we amplify this DNA. Amplify means now we want to make billions of copies of this DNA. And then we will see if this DNA now contains the fingerprints of the virus. For that, we have a very cute enzyme, as you can see here. This enzyme comes from a bacteria. This is the bacteria's name is Thermus aquaticus. What is the name? Thermus aquaticus, meaning aquaticus means water. Thermus means heat. You know, in the water, there are hot springs or in the, in the oceans, there are hydrothermal vents. You know, in the on the floor of the ocean, there are hydrothermal vents where hot things, hot fluids and hot lava and those things are coming out or hot water is coming out. There is a, there is a bacteria called Thermus aquaticus that lives there. That bacteria, of course, remember it replicates. So bacteria has an enzyme in it, which is called... TAQ enzyme or Thermus aquaticus enzyme. So it is a high temperature enzyme. And because our machine works at high temperature, we needed an enzyme that can work in that machine. So where is that machine? Here. Because this machine works at high temperatures, we wanted a, an enzyme that, you, that can work in the high temperature. Before this uh, bacteria, there used to be that the enzymes that work to produce the copies of the RNA at high temperature, those enzymes will be destroyed as well. And every time one cycle of the machine is completed, you have to take the tubes out, put the new enzyme in there because the old enzyme is destroyed and then start it again. So finally, in 1970, there was a scientist who found that, hey, there is a bacteria that lives in there on the hot springs. Why not we take the polymerase enzyme from this bacteria and use that enzyme? So I think that was a pretty clever idea. That person must have been really, really happy that he did that. Okay. So now we have a copy of the, a copy of the RNA in the form of DNA. What we do is, we have, we put the DNA primers. Again, primers are the places that is where the enzyme can start working on. We put the enzyme that we received from this bacteria and we start making copies of the DNA. That is a basic idea. So the, here is how that machine works. The PCR machine. You put the DNA in it. You decide what part of the DNA you are interested in in you know making copies of and how do you decide you take that fingerprint and you put the primers for that then what you do is machine once you put the tube in it machine goes to 96 degrees centigrade it takes about 20 to 30 seconds to stay at this temperature to break the dna into two strands it is just like boiling meat if you take uh, meat and if you boil it, what happens? It is going to become all denatured. It's going to become all destroyed, correct? That is the same thing that is happening here. We have the DNA here. 
we are now heating it up to 96 degrees centigrade that caused the dna to become separated we call it denaturing the dna has become denatured once it is denatured it only takes 20 to 30 seconds then we take the separate strands of the dna so these are separated pieces of dna and we do something that is called annealing annealing is a very simple process it simply means attaching a piece of RNA or another complement DNA to this DNA. Fusing them together is called annealing. Separating them is called denaturing and fusing them together is called annealing. Abdul Jalal, thank you very much. Yes, it is a beautiful to topic. I totally agree with you, Andrew. So back here. So now what we are doing is we have done the annealing. In the annealing process, what happened was we have attached the RNA, sorry, these primers to DNA strands. So remember, this was one DNA piece that got converted into two strands. And now we have two primers attached to two strands. This is the process of annealing. The machine goes down in temperature to 56 degrees centigrade. That allows the machine to that allows the enzymes to do the annealing and this takes about 20 to 40 seconds as well so really fast thank you very much for watching from kuwait so then what happens is then machine goes up to 76 degrees centigrade at this centigrade remember that tac uh, tac enzyme that was received from thermus aquaticus bacteria this enzyme, this is a DNA polymerase. This can work at high temperature. So this guy can work between 76 to about 80 degrees centigrade, 75 to 80 degrees centigrade. So machines usually go to somewhere like 76, 77 degrees centigrade. And that is when this enzyme will create a, a copy of the DNA, the other strand of the DNA. So now one DNA has become two complete DNAs. Once these are two complete DNAs, they go through the same cycle again. So what will happen is that one DNA strand or helix will become two in one cycle. Then when the machine would cycle again, these two are going to become two each. So these will become four. Then when the machine is going to do the cycle again, these four are going to become eight and then 16 and then 32 and then 64 and then 128 and 256 and 512, 1024, 2048, 1496 and so on, right? So when this machine cycles 30 times, it produces a billion copies of the, the RN DNA billion copies of the DNA. Thank you, Tahir. So there are billion copies. And if this machine does 40 cycles, meaning it goes through the cycle of denaturing, that means separating the DNA into two pieces, then annealing to put the primers on each piece, then extension, making each piece into one complete DNA and converting them one piece into two DNAs and then continue doing this process. If you do it 40 cycles, it will produce, produce a, about a trillion copies, a trillion copies. Now what happens is, so the, this machine and this enzyme are bowing to you they are happy that they made a bunch of dna here from one or two viral rnas right now what happens is how do we measure so we've gotten a pile of dna but how do we know that in there was really the virus rna so for that it's a very beautiful thing what happens is we have a we have a molecule which we say is a, a molecule which is a quencher. So this is a molecule. I'll make it in black. This is called a quencher. Quencher. Quench means something that would drink and become satisfied. 
and this is a probe or report reporter this guy is fluorescent it shines but when it is near quencher quencher takes all of it its electrical potential and this cannot shine so that is a basic idea we attach these two guys together so that they can be connected to the dna so these guys this probe this probe gets connected to the dna strands as they are forming which strands remember the dna strands that are forming here these quencher guys and the reporter guys they they become attached there so now remember that this enzyme dna polymerase its function is to go over this strand and make the next strand in that process it removes these guys so let's look at it so here this guy tac enzyme is making the dna on the way the the probe is sitting probe is not shining because the quencher and the reporter are sitting next to each other and quencher is not letting it shine now when the when this look at this diagram when the enzyme reaches while making the dna it reaches the point where the probe was attached it removes the the reporter part and throws it out it will remove the other part as well but first it would remove the reporter part as soon as the reporter part becomes alone it is not with the quencher taking its shine away right away it starts fluorescing it starts shining so the machine is now looking at how the shine is working how much light is produced and that is how we now know the more rna there the more light will be produced and that extra light will then be detected by the machine to tell if there is the viral rna or not so i hope it makes sense did it make sense you take the viral rna you make a complement dna from it then you take the dna and make it complete to strands then you heat them up to 96 degree celsius they separate to each strand that is going to build the second part of it when it is building there is a reporter sitting here with the quencher and when the enzyme comes building and removes the reporter that reporter starts shining the machine has a light on it has a camera on it to see how much light is present and as the machine continues to cycle more and more light is produced or fluorescence is produced which is detected and that is what helps us understand if the rna is there or not does this make sense does this make sense so this is the this is the process by which pcr works is this process clear i'm going to now go to the second part and that is how the second way of identifying or testing so somebody is saying that sir do you have a, a youtube channel uh, so of course go to youtube and just look for dr bean medical lectures okay so i'm getting that this is it makes perfect sense so let's now move on to the second one and that is how the virus can be identified by using patient's serum so let's look at that so i hope that you are looking at the diagram now patient's serum and identifying the virus in the patient's blood is very simple it's really not the virus in the patient's blood it is the antibodies so remember yesterday we did in our lecture i'm going to make that here that when the virus comes into our body so let's say this is the virus when it arrives in our body 
remember the macrophages would come and eat it up so that is a macrophage macrophage will eat it up and macrophage would i'm going to skip all the steps because i did them in yesterday's lecture they would cause eventually through the t helper cells naive then t helper to they would eventually cause b cells to become active b cells and remember active b cells are called plasma cells and these b cells are going to start making antibodies they are proteins made by the b cells these proteins can connect with the virus and neutralize it or opsonize it we discussed it yesterday in lots of detail i would don't want to waste your time but just remember that there are antibodies now this antibody is the immunity to the virus so let's say if i had the virus and my blood my immune system has created the immunity by making the antibodies and then you take my blood and you are you want to know if my blood has the antibodies to the virus or not how you figure that out is by the elisa which is the enzyme linked immunosorbent assay enzyme linked immunosorbent assay it is actually very very simple it's a very simple way to to do it so i'm going to thank you very much hi zizi thank you very much for joining so let's look at how as the elisa works so here is what we do we take a bunch of virus or virus uh, proteins let's say s proteins and we adsorb them in our lab on a plate adsorb mean we just fix them in the plate so let's say that this is s protein of the virus and we have attached that here we have fixed it on a plate good now what we do is we put the patient's serum here we put the patient's serum in here and if the patient serum if the patient was infected by the virus then the patient may have the antibodies that are going to bind with this virus which antibodies mostly igg but they can be igm as well so when we have the virus here the virus s protein and then we have the antibodies from the patient that we put here the antibodies are going to go and get fixated to the s protein now what we do is we wash this well so we remove all the extra antibodies and we just are left with those antibodies that are attached to the virus and if there was no virus so imagine we put the patient's serum here and patient serum has no antibodies to the virus and this is the virus s protein there are no antibodies when you wash it everything will be washed out there will be no antibody left why because the patient did not have the infection if the patient had the infection then the antibodies are now connected to the antigen or the s proteins good now what do we do what we do now is that we take another antibody that we have manufactured in our lab this antibody is going to connect with the patient's antibody so it's going to connect here and this antibody has a tiny a thing attached to it which we call it as a reporter hrp horse radish protein it's a reporter attached to it so it's a tagged or labeled antibody so once we have that antibody then what we do is we we send in a colorless we call it a substrate it's a substance which is colorless but when this substance connects with hrp and remember after the connection here we give a wash again and if the antibody is not present everything will be washed out but if this antibody was is present then this antibody let's call it a the a antibody will get connected to b and will not be washed out 
Then we put the substrate. And if the A is present, then this HRP will make the substrate into a colored substance. And then we measure the color through a color meter or colorimeter, colorimeter, and that would tell us if the antigen was there or not. There are multiple ways of doing ELISA, uh, direct way or indirect way. That's a different discussion. I wanted to make sure that we understand how ELISA is done. Any confusion with ELISA? I'm going to repeat it once more so that you are comfortable understanding it. We take the virus S proteins and we adsorb them to a plate, meaning we fix them on the plate. We put patient's serum in there. If patient was sick and has the antibodies against the S protein, then the patient's antibodies will become fixed to these antigens. Then we wash the serum away so that any extra antibodies that are present, because we have a lots of antibodies, any extra antibodies that are not fixed, meaning they are not against this virus, they are just washed out. So we give it a wash. Then what we do is we add another set of antibodies that are against the human IgG and IgM. So these are antibodies are going to come in and connect here with these guys. And these antibodies have reporters attached to them or they, they are tagged. They have proteins attached to them like enzymes. Then we wash again. Because these guys are fixed, they will not be washed away. Then we put a substrate in here, which is colorless. But once this substrate and enzyme, they work together, the sub this substrate becomes colored. This color can then be looked at by a camera. And we can measure how much color is present. And based on that, we can say if there is the virus antigen present in the system or not. That is what is the that is what is the ELISA test. So I'm going to wrap up today here. There are two types of tests, PCR test and ELISA test. ELISA test would need pa patient serum and PCR test is going to need the nasal swab. Where is the ELISA test being used? For example, here in the New York, they are doing uh, they're donating convalescent plasma. So if I am sick and I have recovered, I want to donate my plasma to give it to someone. So they want to understand if my plasma has the antibodies or not. So they are going to do, do ELISA test on it, detect if I have the antibodies. If I do, then they'll take my plasma to give it to someone else. So ELISA test has a different utility and PCR test has a different utility. There are now test strips that are coming up as well. And hopefully we would have them soon too. So this is the discussion today. I hope that you uh, enjoyed the lecture and it was clear. Yeah, so uh, there is a question here that ELISA couldn't detect the disease before the antibodies are present. No, it could not. So antibodies come in absolutely anywhere from seven days to 14 days until that time that the antibodies are present, ELISA cannot detect them. ELISA is useful to understand if the people in a community had the disease if someone who has the disease and has recovered, they are immune now, they can go out and start working. They can go out and donate their plasma to others. So it is to identify the people who had the active disease. The PCR test is mostly used just to make sure that you understand if it is there or not, but it is less invasive. So guys, thank you very much for joining. I am going to hang up now. And we would continue tomorrow. What do you want to discuss tomorrow? I want you to discuss hydroxychloroquine once again tomorrow because I think we should work on it. Or maybe we talk about vaccination. Which one, which topic do you want? Cool. Okay, guys. <laughs> Please stop saying that China made the virus in lab. I don't think so. So vaccination or uh, hydroxychloroquine, whichever. So we'll work with that.
Thank you very much. I'm going to go. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining. Please share it with others. Please tell others that we are doing this every day. And there is this scientific knowledge that we are offering. So share it with others as well. I'll be grateful for that. Bye-bye.